Welcome to week three. We're at consumer behavior, and this is a it's a flashback if you've done the consumer behavior subject, but also it's an opportunity to grab some of the theories and frameworks that exist around the place, drag them into a self-analysis, and have a look at how these approaches and these models and these ideas either describe you as a consumer of this subject, you as a consumer of the social media that you're going to, or the technology you're going to be using for your ETA, and also set up a framework that you can use for the e-performance review and the e-portfolio. I mean, basically, this is a chunk of equipment, technology, theory, frameworks that you can make use of throughout the rest of the semester. So let's dive in there and take a look. First of all, it is a it's the last part of phase one. So the first three classes have all been about setting up some theoretical, conceptual, and practical elements that you can use to frame in your thinking around what you're going to do the semester on with the ETA. Obviously, the next thing that's coming up on the horizon is that uh, technology analysis. So that's due in the quite soon now. But you've still got time to bring in some ideas and some frameworks. Now, key in what we're going to be doing this semester, metrics are a central part of our operation. It's about being able to understand where we're at, how we're at, and how we're progressing towards our goals, our plans, and our end game. With this in mind, in the ETA, you're asked to produce metrics, and you're asked to produce how a goal and how you're going to measure your path there. But also, with things like your bullet journals, what they're designed to do is to give you a framework by which you can track your progress during the semester. As we go through this particular episode of eMarketing the Theory, you'll see a number of ideas. Frameworks like risk perception, concepts like innovativeness or attention to social comparison information. A number of these have survey scale items attached to them. A quick trip down Google Scholar and you'll find yourself a set of survey questions. What I would invite you to do is if you find a conceptual framework that you look at going, yeah, that would be useful for measuring me during the semester. Look about to see if they've got questions, see if it's got a survey item, see if it's got a scale developed for it, and then bring that scale into either, say, your e-portfolio analysis, how was I doing each week, uh, bring it into perhaps your bullet journal as a, a tracker, as a measurement to say, how am I on this particular criteria this week? Because this is what these devices are for. This is what these frameworks are for. They're used for market research, but they're used to analyze individuals. They're used to quantify, and metrics as quantifiable tools can assist you in tracking performance over time, but also can assist you in self-analysis and understanding, am I on track to get my goal? Am I on track to get what I want from my semester? So a couple of frameworks to kick us off. An old familiar friend. I really do like this model. And the thing to understand is that you're going to be cycling through this frequently this semester. Stimulus, problem awareness, information search. When you are creating an assignment, welcome to this entire array. Stimulus is the assignment. Trigger, problem awareness is, oh geez, I need to write an assignment. I wonder what it's about. I'm going to go Google some stuff for information search. Now I need to go and work out what ideas and what elements I want to bring in. Now I've got to act on those and use the ideas, which I will then turn into an assignment, which I will submit for the post-purchase evaluation of me going, oh no, I've totally failed, oh no, oh no, or yeah, nailed that and then getting the score back, which basically ranges between totally failed and nailed that. 
which triggers the stimulus which takes you into the next area. But functionally, this model is going to be in play a lot, so it's worth getting yourself re-familiarized and also starting to think about how does this work for the potential customer of your project? How are they going to engage, react, find, evaluate you as an alternative? What's going to be their post-purchase evaluation of your content? Start playing with this as a marketer and as a consumer. The next area we're going to deal with, risk. There's a lot this semester that is going to basically functionally involve risk. It's one of those elements. Again, risk is neutral as a term. I just want to put this out up front. It's very easy to think of risk as a negative, but risk is a neutral. It can be a positive and it can be a negative. As a positive, you can sell risk as a feature that can be used to turn into a benefit to co-create value. As a negative, you can turn risk into a threat to be minimized or a weakness to be countered. So it can be an opportunity and it can be a threat. Don't automatically discard risk as, oh no, risk exists, therefore risk is bad. Risk can be a positive feature and it can benefit you. Case in point, financial risk. Uh, if you've ever laid down some money on a horse or backed something at the Melbourne Cup or gambled in any way, shape or form, any betting, any gambling, financial risk was a benefit and a feature that you made use of. And if you enjoyed the experience, whether you won or lost, it's a feature. It's a part. Now, in terms of the ETA, in terms of e-marketing in general, there's a huge chunk of ethical considerations around loot boxes, which is basically gambling for children, gambling, which is gambling for adults, or loot boxes for adults, a whole lot of dark pattern stuff, and a whole lot of ethical problem areas here. Where it's most likely to impact you, if it's not impacting you as a consumer, is the moral choice, the moral compass choice that you make about selecting potential sponsors for, say, a YouTube channel or social media stream. A number of video games that are effectively based on gambling will approach YouTubers for spon and will sponsor YouTube stars and YouTube channels on the assumption that some of that audience will be the kind of person who has the personality to spend a lot of money on their mobile phone game. And basically you're facilitating gambling. Um, it's up to you whether you think that's good or bad. You know, one of the things is it's very easy to look at someone judgmentally and go, oh, you spent money on a mobile game. But did they get value? Did it benefit them? Did they get a better life from it? Again, some of us come from, there are some people out there who will tell you that me merely raising that is unethical, whereas I'm of the opinion that, look, if you are consciously choosing to do it, if you have an addiction that is a medical situation that needs treatment as appropriate, but if you are choosing to purchase something because it gives value to you, then you're choosing to purchase something that gives value to you. You should be allowed to do that. Now. From financial risk, be aware that this also brings you something around when we get to pricing, how do you treat your audience? What, what point in time do you go, I've taken too much money from this audience, I need to move to a new audience. So that opens up things around your answer matrix through to your risk. Now here we're thinking about it from the perspective of have I spent too much? Or it's going to cost me more than I anticipated to under the say the SIVA model, uh, the value is the accessibility, the access requires more money than is value. You buy yourself an Xbox, you buy yourself an Xbox game, and you find out in order to get the most out of your Xbox game, you need to pay a monthly fee, then you need to buy downloadable content. It costs more than you thought to get the value that you anticipated. Second area of risk is social risk. 
this is possibly the uh, area that's got the most impact on the subject. I know that my participation and engagement score at 20 points is a high point cost which is also has a social risk factor attached to it. Presenting in class, speaking in the chat groups, posting to the forum, engaging on the Padlet, performing live in terms of the real-time events, but also putting yourself out there through your ETA project, you may feel a risk of loss of pride, loss of prestige and the eyes of important people. Or that loss of prestige could be, or that loss of pride could actually be a feature. People disliking you for holding a position is Look, don't base a personality around being someone who's disliked for what they believe in. That's not a personality, that's a problem. It goes double if you are from a privileged group that's had very little in the way of challenges systematically and systemically in life. Don't, don't use that as a hook for a personality. Be, have a better personality. Have a more fun life. Have something more enjoyable. Uh, it's also ironic watching, hate watching, and all these other things. Look, like the stuff you like, um, and like it because you like it. That's one of the other things. When I talked about the be evil intentionally, when I talk about be good intentionally, I am a believer in intentionality. If you like something, like it. If the people around you are going to be embarrassed because you thought Cats the Movie was great, then like Cats the Movie because you like it. And frankly, Taylor Swift's role was quite entertaining. Now, the other area in social risk is the fear of missing out. This is something that I am well aware of. We've got a huge FOMO issue inside the modern university arrangement. We record live events. We have pre-recorded events. I've tried to, my best to do a FOMO minimization strategy. But the reality is you when you make a choice, that choice comes with the cost, and that cost is opportunity cost. Fear of missing out is just opportunity cost in a slightly nattier hat and snazzier shirt. Also, though, there is a theoretical framework here, and that's social comparison information, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Physical risk. Now, physical risk and the internet. Who would have thought a virtual environment could have brought about so much damage? <sighs> Gotta love the present and the future's awesome. Now, I watch a lot of professional wrestling and it always starts off with that very somber black and white, black and red. Do not try this at home. Of course don't try this at home. Go to your friend's house and do it. Physical risk is where you're going to have some degree of potential or actual harm as a result of whatever the hell it is you've just done. So TikTok challenges are always the... <sighs> Humans do dumb things because we're human. I say this as someone who has done many a dumb thing pre-social media and will do plenty of dumb things in the future, whether there is a post-social media. But there's always a good moral crisis to be had by going, Oh no, the youth. The youth are being recklessness. TikTok challenges are the one that people are picking on at the moment. Then there was doing it for the gram. Then there was the selfie-related injuries. Then there was the Tide Pod challenge. As I said, it's all fun and games until someone loses the brand. If you're not familiar with what happened with the Tide Pod challenge, it's the perfect case scenario of an idea mutating through translation. So the Tide Pod Challenge didn't begin as the Tide Pod Challenge. It began as this someone on Tumblr posting it. Yeah, and it looks like that's a response to a Tide Pod post. So I think that's a cropped image. But they posted, uh, why are the Tide Pods, why do the Tide Pods look so attractive? Why do they look like candy? That's a really good question. Why did the Tide Pod developer sit there and go, you know what, what if we made it look like it came out of a box of chocolates? 
Yeah, that one's got strawberry. That actually have a strawberry and vanilla to it. Why they did this, I don't know. People just liked it better that way. But then there came the comment of the forbidden fruit, and the, from here it sort of went on of, why do our monkey brains go, see shiny, that should be fruit. And then someone decided that it was, now, I have a conspiracy theory here, and I think the conspiracy theory was, somebody who didn't consume a Tide Pod put it out into the arena to go and create harm. They did it. They did intentional evil to get to be able to say, ha, look at those dumb youth doing their dumb youth things. So my belief is the Tide Pod Challenge was initiated as a deliberate intentional act to cause harm to others. It then mutated to having tied themselves, having to announce, please do not consume the washing detergent. The best part is though, Here's the thing, we can say as much as we like about the Tide Pod Challenge, this is the one we know about as a high profile social media explained internet transmitted event. But look at any object that says, keep out of the reach of children. And the only reason that label's there is that some kid looked at it and went, I can eat that. That's food. This one, we had documentation as to why we ended up in this point. But all the rest of them that say, keep out of the reach of children, they have all been there. They all happened to cause physical risk. All right, psychological risk. One of my personal favorite areas to work in. I play, in my outside life, out beyond my university, I play a number of uh, improv-based game environments where I can play the role of a villain. And I do periodically play a villain because I have a reasonably good capacity to scare the hell out of people. So I, as a services marketer, deliver a service, a high quality service of fear. And the whole thing is, when I do intentionally set out to harm, you'll know. Which also, when I come back to this, and I'm the hyperkinetically bouncy happy person, um, it, it's equally terrifying that I genuinely enjoy marking exams, so I get super excited around the start of an exam because, oh my god, I'm two hours away from awesome, whereas the people in the room are saying, I've just stepped into hell, I've got two hours of an exam, and oh god, why is he excited? Knowing that, in this course there are going to be psychological risks, there are going to be Elements. Now, when you submit that assignment, there's going to be a number of psychological things that you're going to go through. When you put your ETA in, you're going to be worried about what am I going to think? How am I going to judge it? What score am I going to get? I am aware of that, and I'm going to try to do my best to provide you with the psychological feature set that best suits what you want. Now, if you want a villain, if you want me to be all shouty and mean and nasty and stuff like that, please let me know. It's not my style. I like to support people. I like to have people have a good time. Unless you're hiring me to be a villain, in which case uh, I'm all there about the screams. But also on psychological risk, there is a feature set here. Uh, the fact that the Dark Souls video game franchise, which is Frustration Incarnate, has three editions of making you feel bad about yourself and your inability to smash buttons on a remote control fast enough. Three times the market have said, oh, I like that. Can I have another? Horror movies exist. There's a whole genre of causing people to intentionally sit in a darkened room and scare themselves and induce trauma events on themselves. It's a genre. I mean, totally get into it if that's your thing. Uh, you can 
as part of your project. You know, you could do a psychological horror event through Instagram. You could create creepypasta stories as your text-based thing. You could write horror fix for AO3. You could turn the entire of the Care Bears franchise into a murder mystery psychological thriller. I'm uh, pretty confident that Stabby Bear might be a chief witness. Performance risk. Oh, this is big. This. Mm -hmm. I deal with this as a creator of content. I deal with this as a lecturer on an almost daily basis when I'm preparing a course. I am assessing, judging, and looking at the content and the artifacts I'm going to put into the subject and go, will that do the job? Now for you as a consumer, one of your areas of performance risk you're going to be most worried about is, am I getting value out of this course? That's for you to determine, but to my best of my abilities, I am trying to make work integrated and life integrated elements. With regards to the internet, there's a lot of performance risk based elements here. It's when you're trying out a new site, will it get the job done? When you are testing software, will it work? When you're creating content, will the audience go for it? When you are following, you now I have this one as well. Every time I recommend something, I'm like, please don't let that creator do something stupid. Please don't let that creator do something stupid. Or please don't let there be a piece of content that I didn't notice that's quite terrible for um, one of the listeners or one of the people I've recommended it to. So whether it meets the needs or whether there is a sudden failure or whether there's a failure event, a risk of failure event, that's what you've got. To, and you're going to need to come to terms with this throughout the semester because you are going to be asked to try out a range of new technologies, new systems, some of which should fail. Some of these things that I'm asking you to work with should be a mismatch with what, you're, what you see as value. It's okay then for failure. And that's one of the things, there should be points of mismatch. The last place I wanna really get you to be conscious and tracking in the ETA, you are setting goals for yourself. If you don't make one of those goals, I want you to learn from that goal rather than to punish yourself. I want there to be a situation where you go, okay, I didn't meet my milestone. What was the factor that caused me to get there, not get there, or get there sooner than expected? So this is one of the things, The when we talk through a lot of the analysis, a lot of the post facto, a lot of the in-situational analysis during the semester, you'll hear me say a particular phrase, and that is, what happened, what worked, what could have been done differently. Now, done differently is a performance risk modifier. It's about reducing the sense of performance risk. If you didn't reach a goal, or you did reach a goal, how could you have done it differently? What could have been different? Could you have reached the goal in a different way? Could you have had a different performance? Really work on this one. It's one that uh, has potential to stop you from getting the skill set you need to deliver. Because if you are preemptively going and rejecting something on the grounds of, I'm not going to be the best at it I could be first time. If you're dealing with a perfectionism issue or um, something like that, minimizing the sense of performance risk is really important. It also is, in the context of the subject, probably the factor that we've got to address, acknowledge, and moderate around. Also, um, the internet is full of people who encountered performance risks of products being different to what they expected and the cognitive distance of something resolving poorly for them. Now this is paraphrasing, but
but it basically the number of times I have seen someone effectively say, I thought that this was going to be bad. I said it was going to be bad. It turned out to be good. Now I'm really angry that I enjoyed the content because I was wrong and I don't like being wrong. This is a bad product. C minus 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 bad experience. Rather than going, huh, I thought it would be bad, turned out to be good, awesome, I had a good time. Because the performance risk was too heavily tied to reputation, they were unable to move forward. Watch for that, be careful around that, don't let it happen to you. Uh, if you enjoyed something you didn't expect to enjoy, enjoy it. Congratulations, you just got bonus value. Alright, flow state. Uh, the thing I am most vulnerable to, this is my super weakness uh, because both of my professional training uh, I'm a Lego Series Play facilitator I use flow state in my facilitation of my workshops I also use flow state as a means by which when I'm content creating when I'm video gaming and when I'm writing so I am super vulnerable to this and this is the nature of flow state is it's a balance between capacity and challenge. As you are working through the semester, you are going to be more skilled at your craft than you were when you started. So I will have to up the challenge level a little bit. I won't make things faster, I will make more things. So I'll give you eight minutes to do a single task, and then at the end of the semester you'll have eight minutes to do five tasks. And you'll get the five done because you've got the skill that you've developed between first iteration and final iteration. But it's really important to be aware that flow state is a psychological state. It can be addictive and it can have a number of consequences that lead to dark patterns. Uh, the creation of flow that you then put an artificial payment-based barrier in will lead to addictive gambling behaviors. So if you create a flow state in a game, which you then mediate out by tokens, coins, gems, rocks, bears, whatever, that the end user can then purchase another set of bears, it's like, it costs one bear to run. Okay. Ah, uh, I was having a really good flow state experience. I will go just buy myself another 20 bears, oh no, I've just spent $100 on an app, in an app, on things, because I was in a flow state and I wanted to stay in flow. So, again, it's a foundation of a lot of good things, but it can be misused. Um, stimulus reward, stimulus loop, dark pattern, risk. In your own work, in your own experience of the subject, Again, consciousness of this. Uh, we do have a couple of flow state tracking uh, things for the bullet journals. But be aware that it can catch you out when you are going and engaging in the research. You go out, uh, particularly if you're on Instagram, Twitter, or any of the continuous scroll social media platforms, that little, the stimulus of reading the new article, reading the new piece of content, the dopamine reward of processing that, integrating it into your life, your knowledge, the do, learn, feel, dopamine hits, scroll, do, learn, feel, do, learn, feel, do, learn, feel. Use external mediated triggers, use alarms, use timers if you know you're vulnerable. Uh, as I'm recording these videos, I am using a timer to stop me from dropping into flow state that I will talk continuously for two to three hours when I'm trying to knock these out in 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, so signature loss is functional signature element, functional hyperfocus, loss of perception of time. Re-enable time perception by having timers. Re-enable time perception by having alarms have a trigger that can bring you back out of flow state if you find yourself increasingly vulnerable to it. It's beneficial, it does amazing things for you, but you also gotta be conscious of it. And I know that 
it is a risk factor that I'm going to create environments in e-marketing that put you into vulnerable flow state or states and conditions that where you are vulnerable to flow states and I don't want you not having a way out. I want you to know so you can do it consciously, you can choose to engage and you can choose to disengage. Intentionality, acting with intention, it matters. Uh, the dark patterns, I mentioned that a couple of times. Dark patterns, okay, the site itself, I'm little unhappy about the fact that a paid sponsorship gets declared after you've watched the video, which is one of the things they talk about of disguised ads. <sighs> Meta irony is still the problem. Basically with dark patterns what it is is that as marketers, psychologists, and a range of other people who've got skills in these areas, we know how to enact certain conditions and get people to react to stimulus to go into certain patterns. I know that in a flow state I can create a flow state inside a minute by giving you a handful of Lego and a task to construct a Lego object in a minute and you won't notice the passage of that minute. And I can give you 10 minutes and one minute and it will feel the same. So knowing that there are various things that are used as engineering designs and software designs to create patterns and cycles in consumer behavior. And the reason I hate this so much uh, is you don't need to. If you're using dark patterns, your value offer sucks and you are a joke. And it's time to go to the room full of mirrors and take a good hard look at yourself. If you're an engineer, this is the solution. The problem is people aren't buying enough of our stuff. The solution is make it hard for them not to buy things. As a marketer, your view should be if people aren't buying our stuff, what is wrong with our stuff? Why is it not meeting their needs? It shouldn't be let's manipulate the customer. It should be let's work with the marketing mix to find out how we make it better. So. Get yourself familiar with the dark patterns. Now I say this because I'm also, as well as being a marketer, I'm a con artist. Uh, I train, I'm from a family line of carnies in the southeast coast of England. I have trained in con artistry. And the difference between a marketer and a con artist is the con artist never wants to see the customer again. As a con artist, you want to hit your mark and you never want to see that mark again. As a marketer, you want an ongoing relationship with that customer because you want to have been so beneficial for them, they want to come back to you next time. And that's functionally the difference. We as marketers are about value for the customer and the organization. A con artist is about value for themselves and no one else. Know the difference and act on the difference intentionally. Be, again, be intentional. If you're going to do this sort of thing, if you're gonna go dark patterns, do it knowing what you're doing is evil and do it with the intent of, I, today I will manipulate and steal. Don't go out and say, oh, you know, today I'm doing good, I'm doing nice things for society. No, if you're dark patterning, you're doing evil, and if you're gonna do evil, as I said, either don't do it, and be good or own the bloody thing and know what you're doing. Now this middle ground, now this nonsense. All right, back onto the CV theories, things you should know, things that are gonna be handy. And I'm gonna mention ideas. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on them because I just want to flag them to say, hey, go have a look at this. Go pop a Google Scholar or a search on this. Go check what's, what's what. So first area, Interactivity. Hoffman and Novak talk about this back in the 96 paper, the one that's been really influential. Uh, there are two forms of interactivity in the course. There's the human interaction, which is live learning and the forums. And there's machine interaction, which is also the forums. <laughs> Kidding. The idea of the human interaction is this is the real time interplay between people. 
whereas the machine interaction is the on-demand learning. Effectively, interactivity as real-time or interactivity as asynchronous. So it's always important to think about how your content is going to be engaged and how you're going to engage your audience and how your audience is then going to counter engage with you. Do you need to be present for it to take place? For example, Twitch streaming, or do you need, or can you enable it to be asynchronous? Comments uh, on a Facebook page. Second error of theories uh, to go and have a look at co-customization. Uh, it's connected to co-creation of value, but because co-creation of value is present in all marketing transactions and all value, all conversions of value offer into value. Co-customization is where the interaction event allows for the consumer to change part of the offering in the process of the offering being created. For example, we can't co right now, this video is being co-created because you're listening to it, engaging with the ideas and responding to it internally. It's processing, you're thinking about it, maybe you're taking notes. If you use these ideas, then you have value and use. But you can't customize this experience. You can't come back in time to the point I'm recording it now and say, hey, Stephen, could you, could you cover that section a little more? Whereas when we're in the real-time learning events and we're in live learning, you can ask at the say, start of a session of live learning, say, hey, Stephen, uh, I've got a question about customization. Could you go into that a bit further? That would allow me then to change the offering that has value to create that more personalized, directed to you experience. You can also do co customization through automation, uh, and there is a bit of work to be had on that. But basically, the other thing to consider is customization increases the time cost of your value offer, increases its non-financial price. So we're going to come back to that in pricing, but think I'm laying down an idea for you to pick up a bit later. Uh, but also, if you are thinking in terms of your own project, that you're going to rely on audience dynamics and engaging with the audience you're asking for code customization. Uh, oh, this makes me sad every time. The internet can be interest driven. Um, when we talked about niche as a strategy, the fact you can find, if it's out there on the internet, chances are you can find it if you know what you're looking for or other people have looked for it before you. When you go to Google and you start typing in your Google search and it starts providing you with suggestions, that is because this is what other people have thought. Welcome to early majority and late majority. Therefore, these are possible ways in which you could find items of interest. The internet, when you are actively using the internet, is interest driven. You are seeking things out. You are choosing things on your YouTube. You are searching for things in your Google. You are engaging in, you're going intentionally to look for something, you're driven by interest. What has also happened is that the internet is now driving back. <sighs> From a marketing perspective, this is bad news. The algorithm is the antithesis of what we want. The algorithm is a centralization of distribution channels on a platform that's better suited to decentralization. It's about monopolies and blocking. It is not to our favor. So as the revolution and the resistance, it's our job to break the algorithm. Now, when you are passive consuming the internet, and that's when you, know, you crack open your Twitter app, you're scrolling content you've pre-selected to have by the people you followed. When in, when Twitter decides that, oh, look, you don't really, we're not going to show you the linear timeline anymore. We'll just show you uh, a randomly selected 
set of tweets that we think are more important to you, it's no longer your interest, it's the computer's interest, it's the algorithm's interest. Facebook is, in, is getting intentionally worse as a distribution platform because it's intentionally blocking content, which means that it's no longer interest driven, it's back to the one to many broadcast. Hypermediated communication is what makes the internet so powerful. Broadcast TV is what makes TV so vulnerable. And Facebook is trying to become broadcast TV. This means that eventually Facebook is eating its own, it's eating its young, it's going to destroy itself because it's taking the value away from itself. It's destroying its own value proposition. And God knows what the hell is happening inside YouTube's recommendation engine. Nobody knows what's happening in there, except for the fact that the closest we can do is that we know that anger drives interaction and interaction drives the algorithm. So basically hate clicking and hate content and dark patterns are the way that the algorithm thinks we want to respond. That's not sustainable because that's not creating value, it's destroying value. Uh, look, the internet is a flow state by design. That's why Hoffman and Novak talked about it back in '96. Uh, the doom scrolling is flow state by design. A stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response that you don't want to break out of because you don't want to lose the next response. Timer and also instead of a useful metric, we have a metric we could measure. Time on screen became the metric that we measured, therefore time on screen became the behavior that we encouraged, irrespective of the fact that time on screen did not translate to purchase. It isn't translating to useful value creation behaviors for business, but it's easier to measure, and that's why it's getting measured, and that's why we're designing for flow states and doom scrolling because we can measure it therefore we are measuring it and it's becoming the behavior that we're building to improve our measures around self-fulfilling prophecies are self-fulfilling all right uh, a couple of things just on the internet enabled search behavior items of note uh, drawing on some advertising theory as well as cb in order to be sought out and you have to think it to search it. So this brings us back to awareness, evoke sets, problem recognition, frameworks that you're familiar with from both advertising and from CB. Also though, for you inside the preparation of an assignment, any assignment, any subject, you will start from your top of mind evoke set, your awareness set, be able to go into prompted recall. Most, If you start and try and run an assignment on unprompted recall, it's harder than if you use Q techniques, prompted recall, and consciously try and expand the evoke set of things that you're looking for. So right now, this week, go back and have a quick look at problem recognition, awareness, and evoke sets, and uh, Top of mind, so top of mind recall, prompted recall, unprompted recall, and evoke sets. Those are some theories to go look up. Good thing is Google does help you with some prompted recall. Um, literally, one of the things as well is that Google's vast storage of questions that have been asked previously means that you are now able to do quasi-prompted recall. And literally, if you run that Google search of 70s cartoon with talking bears, you will find the cartoon I was thinking about. You'll find three of them. The 70s was a weird time, man. That was a hell of a time to be growing up. All right, search uh, behavior, by the way, this is uh, the AIDA model from advertising, also known as a sales funnel. Search behavior is driven by attention which is then driven by interest, which is then reinforced by attention. Functionally, can something be found? Can you find it again? 
there's a good set of links there to follow, have a look at. The thing with AIDA as a model is that ultimately AIDA's purpose is to bring us down to action. If you're only staying at attention and interest without creating some form of call to action, and a call to action on the internet is usually referred to as a landing page, you want people to, it's not just enough to have, oh, hey, I remember that. It's like, hey, I remember there was this thing called the Bear Steam Bears. If I don't then go out and buy a book or watch a clip or do something, awareness does nothing. Action is all. Action is ultimately what we're after because it's consumer behavior, not consumer intention to behave. All right, I want to mention segmentation here because I want to talk about a couple of things. All of CB theory enables us to create market segments because that's the purpose of a consumer behavior theoretical framework is designed to explain what a consumer does. By knowing what a consumer does, you can then classify them as in or out of a particular framework, which functionally makes it a segment or a segmentation variable. There are some areas here where the idea of the novice, the expert customer, and the expert performer, these become roles that people play. This is also super useful for you to consider in terms of your own skills, your own development across the course. If you find yourself in a position that you are an expert performer of your particular social media platform, and you are then in a position to share that, or you know that you're a novice and you're seeking advice and guidance from others. Look for the market maven. Use these roles. Consciously adopt them. Be shaped by them. Make them make them yours and make them useful. Uh, the Hofstede cultural dimensions. I'm going to just briefly go over each of these. Uh, the thing about these elements as we go through them is it's very easy to use a framework like a cultural dimension, like a Hofstede, and become judgmental with it. Don't turn the platform into a judgment. It, it generally harms your business and it generally harms your approach. And so something like the Hofstede, the notion of the indulgent versus the restraint, this is an area where you can place a low psychological judgment. Oh, indulgent. Indulgent. Oh, bad, bad word if you grew up in a restrained culture. If you're from an indulgent culture, then the idea of restraint, that's a bad word. Instead of going, well, what does that mean for me as a marketer trying to reach this group? If I want to go to a group that's from a culture that's restrained, then I don't talk about how my product brings individualism and makes me stand out from the pack. I talk about how this product helps you support those around you. In fact, I make a product that is more conducive to being shared than it is to being consumed individually. And I support what my market needs. It's still, now if I make a six pack, uh, so I'm gonna, sell the old uh, Pepsi Max can here. I'm going to sell it into a restrained culture. I'm going to sell a six pack because uh, there's the family workplace edition where share with those around you to keep the day going, emphasizing duty. Where so I can also then sell this off the shelf, same object, different packaging, sell it individually and that's it. I, like literally the indulgent culture of self and person and me first out of a can, sell it solid. The split here, long versus short, um, is an orientation in terms of how do we approach the world. Now, if you're of a short-term orientation, then this means that novelty is the antithesis. Things have been that which already exists is better than that which could. That's a counter to innovation adoption, but that also means you're sitting like majority or laggard, which means we've got a value proposition for you, which is 
this is an older idea, you should embrace it because it's from the past. Whereas the world is the long term, the world is in flux, novelty is needed, things are changing, chaos is good. That drives innovation as the message you want to send. Uh, certainty avoidance is also a facet. Uh, this is the one I think is quite important for us to acknowledge. Uh, through some of the stuff that I'm doing in this course, I am providing uncertainty avoidance mechanisms. I believe that things like the bullet journal can create certainty. It can create a ritual, a weekly process by which we establish these are my goals, these are my outcomes, the ritual to create certainty. Also, when we talked about creating the university and performing the university, we talked about ritual, we talk about baseball magic, we talk about these aspects of ways to bring certainty into an environment. And we're currently soaking in one of the most uncertain periods of recent future that we've had. And yeah, frankly, it's awesome. I, I'm loving every minute of it because it's chaos, and that's my thing. But if you are wanting to build on, you are, if you're wanting to get back to normal, versus you are using the phrase the new normal, that is literally where we're at here. There's the new normal, the old, well, there's the old normal, the new normal, and the new different, and those are the basically uncertainty avoidance in play. In the internet, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. So things, specific things you can do for uncertainty avoidance is to follow trends, to use the hashtags, to use the TikTok trending, to use uh, Instagram trending, Twitter trending, to comment on that which is in the trends because this is something other people are engaged in. Uh, the power distance, this is also a thing to be very conscious of in terms of parasocial connection, uh, the power that you can acquire as a, like I'm aware that I have power over you as a student because I'm the one who grades your assignment, therefore I recognize a power distance exists between us. We are by design not on equal footing because the institution of the university gives me the big clout stick of grading and also I've got 30 years experience of using the internet I'm a little bit better at this than uh, many of you so I have an unequal amount of power and institutional support so we work with that that's the thing I, I, I'm it's just a facet now that we work into it's about how I use that power and how we accept or expect this unequal distribution of power to be applied. Uh, the individualism versus collectivism, I raised a little of this before, but this is one of the ones that's really fascinating because it's not a cultural trait as cleanly as one would like to believe. Australians are incredibly collectivist. Yeah, I said it. We have some of the most strated hierarchies and social determinants, even so far as if you can name a suburb in Canberra that's a good suburb, and you can name one that's a bad suburb, and you've got a, a cliche or a stereotype about a suburb, you've got a no one's place in life event. Yeah, there's a lot of it. Uh, so there's basically, there's this whole load of nonsense that was done around Hofstra cultural individualism, collectivism, that functionally was trying to portray entire nations under the one banner, which is stupid, because market segmentation says, no, that's not how society works. And also, reality says, no, we're not, we're not from Star Trek, we're not all wearing the same jumpsuits, because we're all from the planet. Uh, we're all from the same planet, we're all from the same collectivist culture, we're all wear the same jumpsuit. 
well, this was a dumb idea at the time, it's a dumb idea now. The masculinity, the gender, enforced gender roles is a stupid concept. Um, I'm not going to give it any more time than this other than to say it's a stupid concept. It's a terrible way to do segmentation. It is one of the least useful things you can do in market research. So be aware that it exists, but basically when, you put car, when you're parking a car in a car park, you are aware that there are concrete walls around you. You don't smash into those walls, you use your brakes. Be aware that cultural dimension of masculinity and gender roles exists. Don't smash yourself into them. All right, variables for segmentation. It's big, CB is a big area. I've just got to wrap this up fairly fast. We've mentioned innovativeness quite a lot uh, as they lead into the first third of the course. Be aware that innovativeness is supported by a couple of other theories. One is the concept of novelty seeking, the extent to which you are going to pursue the new, the shiny, and the different, and domain specific innovativeness. The concept of each person has a certain area where they are more innovative, and you have areas where you are less innovative. Innovativeness is not a perpetual, all encompassing personal variable, it changes per product category. Attention to social comparison information, really useful concept here that uh, we make quite a degree of use of uh, around peer pressure. The idea with the uh, attention to social comparison information is the extent to which you draw down information about from the social cues of people around you. You can see this as a benefit, you can see this as a detriment. Again, Look this up. One of its applications is the extent to which you will find yourself willing and able to lock into trends that are taking place on your platform of choice. So the higher attention search, I always call it Etsy because that's what it was when I was doing my thesis. The higher you are on attention to social comparison information, the better you will be about engaging with trends and the more easily you will find yourself working with the popular content. The lower you are, the more likely you are to create an original popular trend, but the harder it will be for you to spread that trend. Uh, the final one on that screen there is the normative outcomes. This is the internal self-filter. This is the extent to which you assume that the people around you are paying attention to you and you moderate your decision accordingly. Key trick with this, by the way, is that if you're in a high normative outcomes environment, everyone's too busy worrying about what the people are thinking of them to think anything of you. It's one of the best bug shortcut loops in humanity. We're all sitting there going, oh, yes, but if I say this, what will Stephen think about me? And Stephen's sitting there going, yeah, what will they think about me if I say this? I'm not remembering to think about you at that point. One of those, it is one of those magnificent things. All right, uh, the other things to be aware of is that market segmentation, when I talk about it, it's multivariate. It's age age, identity, behavior, consumption pattern, traits, product category traits. Don't just try and use a univariate segmentation because that makes life harder. The richer the variables, the more elements that you bring in, the easier it is to take those components, those measures you've got, those mixtures of parts, and use them as the foundation for an offering that has value. Because ultimately, the purpose of market segmentation is to create a target market that will respond positively to your offering that has value. The richer your understanding of that audience, the easier it is to create something that they will find valuable. 
All right, let's wrap this in with a theory, a theory and application this week. It's a market segmentation theory. The paper that is linked up has a very good breakdown of market segments all around eSport players. Now, eSports and being an eSports player is a, an option you have for the ETA. You can go off and become a professional Counter-Strike GO player in 12 weeks or less. You can play video games for your ETA so long as you've got a goal at the end. And I'm not just talking Rocket League. But functionally, this paper talks about five types of eSports players. It gives a broad ca categorization. But what it really does is it provides us with a really good example. And it's a five cluster, but I'm only just focusing on two for the moment. About the way in which there are overlaps between segments, but there are prioritization points that we can lean on to say, if I wish to reach this segment, what can I do? How can I reach them? So the competitive players and the casual players, the difference maker is around, obviously, the casual player plays more casually. What do they play more casually? They play Call of Duty. They play casual first-person shooting. This is not necessarily what we would have thought of as casual. Come back over to competitive, and competitive you have FIFA, eSport, digital sport as your priority. This multivariate means that if I want to reach a competitive player, I put my advertising in FIFA. If I want to reach a casual player, I put my advertising in Call of Duty. If I've got something that I think crosses over between the two of them, I go down that list and I know that, okay, if I advertise in FIFA and Call of Duties, I'll get Call of Duty, I'll get both. If I advertise in League of Legends, I only get competitive. If I go Super Smash Brothers, I only get casuals. I want to attract the casuals market. I will go arrange a license deal with Super Smash Brothers to use their content in my advertising. I will be of interest to them because Smash Brothers doesn't appear on the radar for the competitives. The casuals will see their casual game and be attracted to them. They'll get a, an initial attention to it. Targeting down in with the additional information I've got there in terms of what is the facet that they like, what is their um, areas. They're not big on socialization, they're not big on fantasy, but they do like positive. They like having a good time. Casual players like a positive outcome. So big, happy, friendly, cheery advertising using Super Smash Brothers will get their interest and my value offer better give them a good time because that's what they're out there for. And that's how we use our theory. That's why our segmentation lets us create value offers. So give this paper a look and start thinking, yeah, all right, if I want to reach that person, I want to reach someone who's in that audience, what does this data tell me that I can learn to do? And with that, as always, if you want to reach out and connect, I'm available on the socials over the email through the Waddle Connections or lock in a consultation time. CB is a big area, mates. I think we did well to knock it out in the parameters we did. And key is get out there and apply. Get out there and use it. You are a consumer. Use the theory to bolster and strengthen your own operations. Learn about how the consumption environment works for you and take advantage of the fact that we've got these assets to help you help yourself get better at what you do. And with that in mind, See you next round.